Um, this is a picture of the Pacific Ocean from, uh, as seen from Vancouver Island. Um, and this is our, just a picture of our building. And uh, the point I want to make uh, is that uh, this is a, a cancer clinic. So it, we see about 5,000 new cancer patients every year. Uh, all types of cancer are treated uh, with the exception of leukemias or childhood cancers which are treated in Vancouver. Everything else comes here. And our research center is up on the third floor. So the nice thing is we're, we're embedded within a clinic. So we have doctors, nurses, patients, pharmacists, uh, scientists, all under the same roof, all working closely together. And therefore, it's a great environment for doing translational cancer research, uh, which is what we try uh, to focus on. This is a picture of uh, our staff uh, from uh, last year. Uh, there's about 40 people right now. There's room for 50 or 60. So we're still growing and we're gonna hire a few more faculty members. Right now there are three principal investigators, myself, uh, Peter Watson and Julian Lum, and then grad students, postdocs, technicians, etc. cetera. And in, in one word, our focus really is immunology and looking at the immune response to cancer, which is what I'll talk about today. Oh, that's Katie, by the way. Ah. <laughs> we are just talking oh, yeah. about the mice. <laughs> okay, so on to talking about science. So uh, the first point I wanna make is uh, uh, immunologists, we always talk about self versus non-self. The immune system has to discriminate between your normal self and foreign invaders. So cancer presents an interesting uh, problem in that it's really an altered version of self. The tumor comes from, of course, your body, uh, but it picks up many genetic alterations along the way. And this is a spectral karyotype analysis showing the chromosomal uh, patterns from six different breast cancers. And uh, as you would know, I'm sure uh, a normal cell would have a pair of each type of chromosome. The chromosomes are painted here with a, a molecular chromosomal paint that, that colors the different chromosomes. And the point of this slide is to show uh, that there are gross alterations of the, of the genome um, present in cancer. So just starting with this case here, we can see, for example, there's three copies of chromosome one instead of two copies. Um, and uh, six copies of, of chromosome five. Of course, you can see interesting multicolored chromosomes here. This is cases where different chromosomes have been cut up and pasted back together in abnormal configurations. So very significant rewiring of the genome occurs, which is uh, everybody knows. Uh, another thing you can see right away is that uh, the six different tumors shown here are all different from one another. So we, uh, there's a, this is this whole idea of needing personalized cancer medicine is that no two tumors are exactly the same. Now, of course, we also know uh, if one looks uh, at a deeper level and uses computer algorithms, et cetera, you can certainly see patterns that are common to these cancers, but the details can be very different. So it's very interesting as an immunologist to question or ask the question, how does the immune system see the cancer genome? Does this look mostly like self or mostly uh, foreign? So the issue is further compounded by the fact that, that cancers often spread to the lymph node where the immune system lives. So this is an example, uh, a diagram showing breast cancer, a breast tumor. And if a tumor is going to spread, the first place it usually goes is the nearest lymph node, which is known as the sentinel lymph node. And, and from there, it may spread to other parts of the body. So this is what uh, a lymph node metastasis looks like. And this is breast cancer. So this is a, mostly a lymph node. Um, and what we see here are the cancer cells, which have uh, metastasize from the tumor into this lymph node. And then we see all the lymphocytes, the small little dots 
around here. So as an immunologist, this is a very insulting picture to me because uh, here a cancer has spread right to the lymph node, which is the headquarters of the immune system, and it seems to not be rejected. Instead, it seems to be actually growing there, prospering there, and uh, one would hope that these lymphocytes might launch some sort of attack against this tumor. And in fact, the good news is there is an immune counterattack. So just as the tumor can spread to the lymph node, the lymphocytes can then migrate back to the tumor and start attacking the tumor. And this is the phenomenon known as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or TIL, which we talk a lot about. So this is what TIL look like. Uh, I'm switching now to ovarian cancer, but I'll jump around a little bit, but most of my comments are very general and can be applied to any epithelial cancer. But uh, we've done a lot of work in ovarian cancer, which I'll show you now. So this is, uh, uh, these are two different cases of ovarian cancer. Um, and they've been stained with an antibody to CD8, which picks up these so-called uh, killer T cells. And they're called killer T cells because they kill things. They kill viruses, they kill, and as we see, they kill tumors as well. So you can see that this tumor on the left, uh, in brown, we see a large number of these CD8 positive killer T cells. Uh, and they are infiltrating the tumor, just like soldiers going into a battlefield. Uh, killer T cells have the ability to go up to a tumor cell and lock onto it, poke holes into it, and inject toxic compounds into the cell. And the tumor cell can dissolve, just disappear within a few minutes of this encounter. So they are very potent cells. This is how T cells kill viruses or virus infected cells, and this is how they kill tumors. So you can imagine that this is like, like a battlefield and these T cells are in there actively killing off the tumor cells. So that's one patient. This patient has the same disease, but for some reason, her immune system is not responding as strongly. So just very few killer T cells are present there. And we can find examples of patients in between. These are the two extremes that I'm showing you here. Uh, so it's a continuum. But what's interesting is if we look at survival, and this is a study we published uh, last year looking at a, close to 200 patients, and we stratified the patients according to whether they had a dense infiltrate or a sparse infiltrate. Patient on the left, patient on the right. And you can see that uh, the patients with a dense infiltrate have a much better survival rate than those with the sparse infiltrate. And so this is uh, 10 years out, just to uh, give you some perspective on the time. So now you might say a few things about this. You know, one thing you might say is, well, I wouldn't want to be even on the blue line because it's going south uh, quite rapidly. And this is, ovarian cancer is a very challenging cancer and, and it has a very high mortality rate. So that's certainly true. Uh, you might also ask, is this really an important difference? And for those of you who don't work in oncology, um, I'll just say that this is a very clinically significant difference. If we had a drug that could do this, make this kind of impact in ovarian cancer, that would be a blockbuster billion dollar drug. Uh, that would be a big breakthrough. And what's exciting to me is that this is what the patient's immune system is doing without us even trying to help. These patients have not had vaccines or any form of immunotherapy. They're having surgery and chemotherapy only. And it just shows the power of the immune system, what a strong influence it can have on outcomes. So when I talk about immunotherapy, to me it simply means, you know, what are some good ideas for how we can enhance this natural process? Uh, what can we do to get women on the red line up to the blue line, and can we push everybody closer to the top? Uh, I don't think immunotherapy will replace surgery or chemotherapy, but, but can, we, can they work together? So those are the 
uh, that's what excites me about the field. And these are actual hardcore facts from the clinic that make me believe the immune system is important in cancer. So using um, this same technologies, we can look at a number of other immune markers as well. So I've shown you killer T cells. Uh, we can take the same data set and stain it for things like CD3, which picks up all T cells, uh, something called TIA1, which picks up the, detects the granules within killer T cells, and so it's a marker of, of functional T cells. Uh, something known as FOXP3, which is a marker of so-called regulatory T cells or suppressor T cells, which surprisingly, um, I won't get too into this, but we find is actually associated with a, a good outcome uh, in ovarian cancer. Uh, T cells recognize antigens via the major histocompatibility complex, MHC1 and MHC2. And similarly, we find that expression of these MHC1 and 2 is also associated with survival. And B cells are important as well. So CD20 is a marker of B cells, and we can see uh, that if you have a lot of B cells in your tumor, that's uh, similarly associated with survival. So an important point is that all of these different cell types, cell populations, are highly correlated with each other. So if you have CD8 cells, you're likely to also have B cells, FOXP3 cells, et cetera. Very strong correlation. So there's quite a party going on in these tumors, if you will. If you have a good, strong infiltration, there's a lot of players there, a lot of different cell types. And the interesting thing is to try and understand how these cell types are working together to promote the favorable outcomes that, that are shown here. And that's uh, uh, the, the nature of our research. I'll just speak for a moment about CD, the CD20 positive cells. So just because uh, those in the tumor immunology field would know that really the focus is usually on T cells, but I think that there's not enough attention paid to the B cell infiltrates as well. So B cells are uh, important. They make antibodies for one thing, but they also can be antigen presenting cells. They make cytokines. There's a number of things they can do. So as I said, Having B cells in your tumor is a good thing associated with survival. And one question we've asked is whether those B cells are activated and uh, clonal B cells that are making antibodies. And so we've uh, done some sequencing uh, looking for evidence of clonal expansion and somatic hypermutation in three patients shown here. And all I really want to say about this is that if you look in any of these tumors, we see there, there is typically a primary clone shown in black, which might be up to 20% of the B cells. And then you have some secondary and sort of tertiary clones in terms of frequency. So this is telling us these are not just random B cells just flowing through the tumor because there's blood flowing through the tumor, but they are instead they are, we think, tumor reactive B cells that are undergoing clonal expansion reacting to the tumor. And that is further supported by, if we look at the evidence of somatic hypermutation, uh, which tell, we see that, in fact, there is somatic hypermutation, and that tells us that these, these B cells have undergone a process of affinity maturation. So for non-immunologists, all I'm saying is this is a good, healthy B cell response that we're seeing in these tumors. And the question is, how are those B cells contributing to survival? So we don't know, uh, but we're uh, uh, about to start studying this in more detail. But I did, um, for those that are interested, I just uh, wrote a review article for Journal of Immunology that, that discusses this, the importance of B cells, not only in ovarian cancer, but others have made similar observations in other types of cancer. And uh, this is just a figure from this review article, but showing that B cells, it's, Yes, they make antibodies, and we know that antibodies can have an anti-tumor effect. But again, B cells do a lot of other things as well, and uh, 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 such as making cytokines and chemokines, they can actually directly kill tumors in some cases. 
and um, they can act as a mediate antigen presentation to T cells. And in fact, I think this might turn out to be one of the most important things that these B cells are doing in the tumor environment. Uh, so we'll be investigating that. Uh, just a similar slide, but this is actually now looking in breast cancer, uh, estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, which is the, one of the most uh, lethal types of breast cancer. Uh, just to make the point that what I've said for ovarian cancer applies also to breast cancer and many other types of cancer as well. So here we're showing a similar set of markers associated with survival. So in my mind, you know, what are the big questions that arise from this work? Well, uh, one question is, we'd like to know what antigens are these T cells and B cells recognizing? Uh, we'd like to know what happens to these cell responses, these T cell responses during standard treatment. So everything I've told you so far is based on what the tumor looks like at the primary surgery. But the patient then undergoes treatment and as we'll discuss, you know, what happens to those lymphocytes during that phase? Very little known. And then, of course, we'd like to know how can we enhance the activity of these cells? So uh, I'll just tell you three stories related to each of these questions. Uh, I don't have answers to any of these questions, actually, but I'll at least give you some idea of how we're approaching them. So with respect to antigens, uh, a lot of work has been done in melanoma in particular, looking at tumor infiltrating T cells and, and trying to figure out what antigens are being recognized. And this is just a list of some of the antigens that have been shown to be recognized by TIL. Uh, and in particular, antigens that, have under, that carry point mutations. So thinking back to those chromosomal pictures I showed of the, of the mutations in tumors, uh, people have shown, for example, in melanoma, uh, uh, and, and each of these really is just one patient where this has been shown. None of these, you know, cancer is a very random process, so none of these are universal antigens by any means. But somebody showed in one melanoma patient that fibronectin had a point mutation and that the T cells in that tumor recognized that point mutation. Um, Another person, probably a graduate student uh, for each of these, showed that HSP70 in melanoma had a point mutation and was recognized by the T cells, um, and so on. So one starts to get a, when you stack all these papers up, an impression that these uh, T cells might be recognizing point mutations and perhaps fusion genes, et cetera, uh, in, the, in the tumor. So if that's true, uh, well, we've now entered an era with so-called next generation sequencing where we might be able to answer this question on a big scale now because it's now possible, as you're probably aware, to take tumors and using platforms such as the Illumina platform, sequence the entire transcriptome, genome, exome, um, what have you, and generate a list of all the mutations and then ask after the fact uh, whether the T cells recognize those mutations. So at the BC Cancer Agency, uh, we have a very strong genomics group, and they've been taking a number of different tumors, running them through the Illumina platform, and they've made some very interesting discoveries. Uh, none of these are, this is not my work, I wish it was, but it's um, a, a work from our genome center, uh, just to give an example of the power of this technology. So for example, um, they, David Huntsman's group looked at a rare type of ovarian cancer, not the type I've been talking about, which is more common, but a rare subtype called granulosa cell tumors, uh, they found that 96% of these tumors have a mutation in the FOXL2 gene. So they discovered a new driver mutation uh, in this way. Uh, they then looked at another type of ovarian cancer, uh, another rare subtype, endometrius uh, associated, and found mutations in uh, a gene called ARID1A ARID in uh, something like 40% of these tumors. Uh, they've, uh, another group, Sam Apricio's group, has taken breast cancer and sequenced the entire uh, transcriptome of breast cancer and found in the one sample they looked at, there were th a total of 32 mutations 
uh, in the tumor. It gives us some idea of how many mutations might be out there. And something we're quite excited about, and I'll show you a little bit of data on, but is in, is in lymphoma. Uh, Marco Mara's group uh, I discovered mutations in a gene called EZH2 uh, that's present in about 25% of follicular lymphoma and 45% of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So what's interesting is this mutation always occur at the same tyrosine residue, tyrosine 641, and it can be mutated to any one of four different substitutions, but it's always in the same spot. So it's very easy to type patients now for the presence of this mutation, and we're interested in uh, could we potentially de develop a vaccine that could be used to target this point mutation. And so uh, we've been doing that just starting with some health T cells from healthy donors of uh, doing in vitro stimulations with peptides corresponding to mutant EZH2 versus wild type EZH2. And all this graph is showing us is that in, in a couple of subjects so far, we've been able to generate T cells that recognize mutant EZH2 in blue, but not the wild type version and we've seen that in at least a couple of donors now. So this tells us, uh, it, so far it looks promising that we may be able to develop a vaccine that targets this, this mutation. And the nice thing, of course, is in a lymphoma patient, the lymphoma cells would be the only cells in the body that, that would uh, express that mutation. So it should be a very specific therapy. The, our genomics friends are excited about this because EZH2 is a transcriptional regulator. It's in the nucleus. It's not a kinase or anything. So it's very hard to target using standard pharmaceutical approaches. Uh, but the nice thing about T cells is they don't care what, uh, uh, what type of protein it is. T cells just read sequence. And so if it's got an altered sequence, in theory, it can be recognized by T cells. So to answer to not answer the first question, um, what, what uh, antigens are being recognized, it really, for most cancers outside of melanoma, it's really largely unknown. Uh, but we now have this project underway uh, focusing on ovarian cancer to use the next generation sequencing to sequence tumors and, and then ask whether the T cells recognize the mutations. So I'll switch now to the second question, uh, which I also don't have the answer for, but I think is really important and worth at least presenting as a question, and, and I'll tell you how we're approaching it, which is what happens to these immune responses during standard treatment. So the reason I think this is important is really illustrated here, and we'll stick with the ovarian cancer example for, for now. But this is one of our patients, a patient from one of our uh, research studies, and she represents a very typical ovarian cancer patient. So she came in um, with ovarian cancer. We have a blood marker called CA125, which is elevated in, in women with this disease. It's like PSA for prostate cancer. So this woman came in with a very high CA125, and she had the typical standard therapy, which is surgery followed by chemotherapy. And chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is always um, platinum with uh, taxane. So carboplatin plus docetaxel is a typical combination. And like most patients, she responded extremely well to this treatment. So ovarian cancer is very platinum sensitive. But unfortunately, the majority of women, like 80% of women, will suffer a recurrence one, two, three years later as shown here. So the tumor came back. She was treated again with chemotherapy and put into a second remission. Uh, but as is very typical, this was short-lived, shorter than the first remission even, very typical. And the cancer came back. She was treated again with chemotherapy, failed to respond, and she passed away um, a few months later. So this is a textbook uh, example of ovarian cancer. The reason I'm showing you this is uh, think of what the immune system might be 
going through during this, these different phases. So first of all, you start with a large tumor burden. You remove it instantly with surgery. So any suppressive factors the tumor was making are suddenly great, greatly reduced. You then give chemotherapy and the platinum works by basically shredding the genome, you know, just cross-linking DNA, causing gross abnormalities in the genome such that the cancer cell undergoes mitotic collapse the next time it tries to divide. So I showed you how, how bad the chromosomes were to begin with. Well, now you're giving a, a treatment that causes even more genomic alterations. So the potential for even more uh, antigens to be produced, neoantigens to be produced. Also, let's remember chemotherapy might uh, have a direct effect on the lymphocytes. There's, they, are, they can be sensitive to chemotherapy. Uh, so then that's all, you have this phase of remission, uh, additional chemotherapy, increase in tumor burden, all of these changes going on. And what's remarkable to me is what I showed you a few minutes ago, that the presence of TIL way back at this stage is a significant predictor of what's gonna happen 10 years later. So I think we need to understand what's happening to the till during, during this part. The problem is, and the reason almost nobody really knows the answer to this, is because it's rare to have tumor samples beyond the first surgery. They don't usually do a second surgery because it's not of any benefit to the patient. So really all you can get is blood samples most of the time. Or uh, with ovarian cancer, you can get ascites the fluid from the abdomen uh, which contains tumor in it and study that. But really, it's, this is a real difficulty with human cancer research is, is having access to some of these later specimens. So I'll just tell you a few brief things that we're doing that start to address this. So the first thing we wanted to ask is a very simple question. Well, does chemotherapy hurt the lymphocytes or not? And you know, most people would right away say, yes, it does. And most clinicians assume that that's the case. Well, in ovarian cancer, that's not the case. So this is looking at something known as the absolute lymphocyte count, just measured in blood. Uh, during six cycles of chemotherapy and a sample of 75 patients. And what's really interesting is that there's virtually no change in your lymphocyte count as you go through chemo. Now, this might not be true for all types of chemo, but it's true for platinum uh, taxane-based chemo. What really suffers is the neutrophils. So you can see that those are um, going down progressively with each treatment. And in fact, this is a dose-limiting toxicity for chemotherapy is the, the loss of neutrophils. So I, I think the first thing we've learned really is that the lymphocytes might be okay during, during the chemotherapy. We've asked, you know, are, is it possible that chemo and standard treatments are inducing immune responses by creating new antigens, um, inflammation, et cetera? And so uh, one set of experiments we've done is just looking for the development of antibodies, autoantibodies, uh, in our ovarian cancer patients. And we just look at these using a simple Western blotting technique against a tumor lysate. And this is results from one patient showing prior to treatment and then during surgery and chemotherapy, you can see the development of an autoantibody response to a number of different antigens in the tumor uh, during, uh, during treatment. We see this kind of pattern, or a pattern, in about 25% of patients uh, undergoing treatment. Uh, we don't know now, but we're gonna be looking at whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. How does it influence outcomes? We don't know. Uh, we had looked previously, it published in prostate cancer, patients undergoing hormone or radiation therapy, we saw much the same thing uh, in about the same proportion of patients. And there we have a mouse model, um, which indicated to us, uh, I don't have time to show the data, but, that, but actually that this kind of response was associated with a poor outcome, so early recurrence. Uh, but remains to be seen whether that's true in humans and whether it's true in, in ovarian cancer. 
But the point is um, the immune system is changing during treatment. We can look at T cell responses uh, using something known as um, TCR spectrotyping. It's a flow cytometry based method. And really this just gives you a, a fingerprint of the T cell clonality that's present in a sample. And all I want to say about this is we can compare in this, it's the same patient, we looked at their primary tumor versus their recurrent tumor. And we did fingerprinting of the T cells. And, and what we found, for example, this green arrow tells us that the, uh, this particular T cell population increased in the recurrent tumor. And the red arrows show us T cell populations that decreased uh, from primary to recurrent tumor. Uh, what does this mean? It just tells us at a very gross level that there are, we think, major changes underway uh, uh, with the clonal composition of these, of these TIL. So I showed you before the absolute lymphocyte count in blood doesn't change, but the particular T cell clones that are present in the tumor seem to be changing over time. And we want to... Uh, look at this in more, more in depth uh, using a new sequencing based profiling of T cell receptors that we developed in collaboration with Rob Holt at our Genome Sciences Center. And I won't go into the details, but basically using next generation sequencing, we can, we can now track millions of individual T cell clones in tissue or blood specimens and track them over time in these patients and, and try and learn uh, how this T cell response is changing. So to summarize this question, important question with not very much data, but we do see major changes in autoantibody and T cell responses. And we think it, it's worth now looking at outcomes to see whether these changes are uh, associated with good or poor outcomes. So last thing I'll talk about, and I actually have the most data on um, because it's in mice, uh, which you can actually do experiments that give you clean answers, is how can we enhance the activity of these T cells? So uh, I'm gonna talk about a mouse model of breast cancer where we've really studied this question. And in fact, uh, Oscar's group here is, is using this model as well, looking at uh, DNA-based vaccines. Uh, we're, we're doing slightly different things with it. But the model I'll just describe to you briefly, it's first of all, it's a standard uh, black six background. So it's a mouse with an intact immune system. And we made a transgene where we took the HER2 new oncogene, which is a common oncogene in breast cancer. It's in about 30% of breast cancers. It's a receptor tyrosine kinase. And what we did was we tagged the C terminus of this um, uh, protein with epitopes that could be recognized by T cells. So immunologists will understand that we, we chose the so-called OT1 and OT2 epitopes, which are from a protein called ovalbumin. And uh, immunologists love these epitopes. They're used in all sorts of different models for studying bacterial responses, viral responses. And so it's a, a nice, it allows us to compare our results in a tumor model with what others have done in the past in other systems. Uh, but by putting these tags on, you'll see the power of this in a minute when I get to looking at T cell responses. <clears throat> so we then crossed in a dominant negative version of P53, which was necessary to get a reasonable uh, penetrance in, of tumor formation. And so these mice now have two transgenes, this one and that one. And as a result, in their mammary epithelium, they have the strong oncogene, HER2, coupled with disabled DNA repair due to the dominant negative P53. So a double whammy. Um, and as a result, as expected, after six to 10 months, really it's true. <laughs> no. Uh, you, uh, these mice develop spontaneous mammary tumors that express this construct, the ovalbumin tagged version of new. So this is what we wanted. Now we've got mice developing spontaneous tumors and we can start studying the immune response. So the reason we put those tags on is because 
we can take killer T cells and helper T cells from other mice that are engineered to make these T cells. And we know that these T cells recognize those tags that we put on the oncogene. So we're taking the antigen out of the equation. We're saying, let's give them a really strong antigen and, and we, with certainty, we know that those T cells should recognize the tumor based on the antigen being there. These T cells can be labeled with dyes or with congenic markers and then we can put them into the mouse bearing the tumor and they will swim around in the mouse and they will eventually find the tumor and we can then ask how do the T cells respond to the tumor? Do they proliferate? Do they recognize it? Do they become suppressed in some way? And we can ask how does the tumor respond to the T cells? Does it become infiltrated? Does it regress or does it escape in some way? So I'll just show you what happens. In the, this is the best case scenario. Um, and in fact, the very first mouse we treated with T cells, this was the kind of response we saw. So uh, this is a tumor. This is just one day after transfer of the T cells. And we're staining now with CD3, which is a marker of T cells. And you can see uh, just a few T cells in the tumor, a lot of tumor cells, kind of looks like patients that have a poor prognosis, you know, not a very strong infiltrate initially. And in fact, that's true. If we just left the mouse without T cells, it would die of its disease. About three days after transfer, we can start to see a few more T cells coming in and you can see they're really infiltrating right in between the tumor cells. And then this is five days after transfer. Uh, again, best case scenario, but you can see now the tumor is just absolutely chock full of T cells. In fact, the tumors often increase a little bit in size at this point because they're so full of T cells, but then they just collapse. Uh, and by seven to 10 days, tumor completely disappears and it never comes back. It's a complete eradication of these tumors, which I, as I said, the very first mouse we did the experiment with, this is what happened. And we were shocked because we weren't actually trying to cure the mouse. We assumed the tumor was gonna somehow escape from the T cells, but instead the T cells clearly uh, eradicated the tumor. So it was kind of exciting, but then I woke up the next day and I thought, well, I don't think this is a very good model because I don't think human breast cancer is gonna be quite as easy as that. But it turned out to be a good model because we, don't, we see those complete responses some of the time, about a third of the time. Uh, but the rest of the time we see either partial responses or stable disease. And about a quarter of the time we see progressive disease. So the tumor just keeps growing and the T cells have no effect. So this was published uh, the initial model was described in 2007. So it's a nice uh, uh, model then to potentially try and figure out um, why T cell therapy works some of the time, but not all of the time. Uh, and it was very obvious to us actually, um, some of the mice actually come in with multiple tumors. So they might have three tumors at the same time. You give them a dose of T cells and you might see this tumor disappear and this one keep growing you know, at the same time. So right away it became obvious to us it wasn't a systemic property that was driving these responses, but the, something in the local tumor environment that seemed to be important. So that focused the question towards what factors dictate the sensitivity of these different tumors to T cells. So it's great to have a spontaneous tumor model and we were discussing this earlier today, but it's kind of ironic that uh, you go to all the trouble to make the model. And then once you have a complete response like that, there's no tumor left to study. You know, you've got a tumor, you give a treatment. You, initially, you can't predict what the treatment response will be. If the tumor disappears, it's gone, nothing left. So we somewhat ironically have ended up making tumor lines, cell lines from these tumors and studying the, the lines instead. And that's turned out to be, I think, a very fruitful uh, approach. So this shows three different lines that we've generated. And so just to get, what we do is we 
take a mouse with a spontaneous tumor, we don't treat that mouse. We just take the tumor out and generate in vitro a, a cell line. And we put that cell line into a number of secondary hosts. And we allow tumors to grow. And then we treat those tumors with T cells. And we ask, what, is it, what kind of response do we see? And remarkably, so we've got a couple of lines, NOP21 is an example, where 100% of the time we see a complete regression of that line. And I know this looks too good to be true, but really it's, it's, that, it's that good. We're, we love this cell line. Uh, we've got a number of lines, like this one here, where we get a partial response where the tumor shrinks 50% or so and then comes back. And then we've also got a number of lines that show progressive disease uh, like this. So now we've got a, a very nice system where we can start to compare, ask what's different about these tumor lines. And to jump to the conclusion of a, of a lot of work on the part of Michelle Martin, one of my graduate students, it seems one of the biggest issues is the infiltration, the permissiveness to infiltration of these tumors. So this is a time course of three different tumors a CR, a PR, and a PD, and stained for CD3 for T cell infiltration. And what you can see is that this, this is the one I already showed you initially, uh, the best case scenario. Looks good. The partial responder gets infiltrated early on, but then those infiltrates disappear over time. And the progressive uh, phenotype, typically what we see is a little bit of infiltration, not very much and essentially, and it's short-lived, and the tumor just continues to grow. Uh, not shown here, but what we often see is if you look at the periphery of the tumor, you'll see the T cells lined up on the outside of the tumor, but they can't get in. So there's some sort of barrier there. So we've asked then what, what might be different between these tumors at a histological level. And so, uh, we had our breast cancer pathologist, Peter Watson, look at a number of these tumors, untreated tumors. He was blinded. He didn't know what kind of response the tumors gave, but he looked at a total of 68 different tumors and scored them by standard pathological criteria. And the result of that was that it turns out that the CR tumors, the complete regressors, have more stroma in them. And as a result, our Along with that, they therefore have less necrosis. I'll show you what that means. So this is a, a CR tumor, and these are the tumor cells, and you can see this stromal, strands of stroma running through the tumor. And those probably undoubtedly have blood vessels in them, et cetera. And I think of them as sort of highways that the T cells can use to get into the tumor. This is one of the progressive tumors. It's just a big ball of tumor cells a necrotic center, that's not stroma, but ne necrotic cells due to lack of blood supply. And then the stroma is, is limited to the exterior of the tumor. So for me at least, it's easy to, if I was a T cell, I think I'd rather try and get into this tumor than that one. We've also done some athimetrics experiments looking at um, tran you know, the transcriptional profile of these tumors. And, this is interesting because we uh, performed what's known as an unsupervised clustering of the data, uh, looked at a number of tumors and, and, and did this. And so in, in this kind of scenario, you just feed the raw data into the computer and ask the computer to tell you what patterns does it see. So we didn't tell the computer which were the responding, responsive and non-responsive tumors. And the computer uh, split the tumors into two major families and it grouped the complete and partial responders together and separated out the progressive disease uh, phenotype. So this is a, uh, excited by this result. We're still excited by this result, but the problem is if you ask, what are the genes that are determining these branches of the family? Well, there's something like 300 different genes that are responsible for these differences. And so now the challenge is figuring out which one of those genes or handful of those genes are the most important. And 
I'll just give you one example of, this is one of our favorite of the 300 um, for a number of reasons, but I don't mean to imply that this is, that we have found the answer yet. Um, but, so it's sort of preliminary data, but the reason we like it, it's, it's, so it's called Claudin-4, it's a tight junction protein. And you can see, if you look at averages, it's, it is down in the CRs and up in the PDs. And it sort of makes sense. You've got these epithelial tight junctions making for that sort of tight ball of tumor cells. If you look at actual you know, tumor by tumor data, you can see that it's, it's not up in all of the PDs, but just some of them. And, um, and in fact, it's even up in one of the PRs. So it's, it's like any gene expression data in human cancer. It's not perfect correlation. But if you average stuff out, um, it gives you a sense that this might be important. We also think it might be important because another group has shown in human breast cancer that high Claudin-4 expression is associated with poor survival. And we think perhaps they didn't look at the till in this case, but perhaps it's because the high Claudin-4 uh, is associated with low till. It at least gives you some idea how we're how we're thinking about these genes. So uh, in, just, in conclusion, I'll just tell you one more story, which I think is, brings some, uh, some good news to this whole scenario. Uh, so with these, so I, you know, what I've told you so far is that some tumors are sensitive to T cells and some are not. Now we've thought about what we can do with that information. And one would be to have a predictive test. So if a woman comes into the clinic, take a sample of her tumor and try and predict, will you be sensitive to immunotherapy or not? And the problem I have with that though, is in real life, human breast cancer often is multifocal disease. So more than one tumor site. And really it's the metastasis that kills people. And that might be starting from your bone marrow, your brain, your liver. What your primary tumor looks like may not reflect, does not necessarily reflect what those metastatic sites look like. So really, I think we could all agree what would be better would be to have a treatment that works against all tumors all of the time. So you don't need to predict. And uh, the nice thing about T cells is that they can be influenced in a number of ways through vaccination, through cytokines, or you can even potentially genetically engineer the T cells. And so we have asked the question, can we engineer T cells to break through infiltration barriers? And it's not because necessarily I think the future of cancer will be genetic engineering of T cells. Maybe, but, but by doing this kind of thing in mice, you can at least start to learn some, some principles around it and, and maybe come up with a, a more practical solution for the clinic. I don't know. But what we decided to do was look at a gene called Sybil B, which is a ubiquitin ligase, and others had shown it's a negative regulator of T cell signaling. So it's like a break in T cells. And if you take a knockout mouse, Sybil B, the mice develop severe autoimmunity and they die at about three weeks of age or something. It's a very uh, important regulatory molecule. But we thought, well, this would be perfect in our tumor cells if they had an autoimmune phenotype. Uh, maybe they'll be better at killing the tumor. So we did a simple experiment, um, compared wild type killer T cells to ones lacking the Sybil B gene. The mouse itself was the same old mouse. It's a wild type mouse uh, carrying our different tumor lines. All we've done is, is genetically engineer the T cells by removing one gene and then asking the same questions. And so this just shows you on day seven of, this is one of our progressive tumors, NOP6. If we use wild type OT1 cells, we get this level of infiltration but the same number of these Sybil B knockout OT1 cells, you can see we've got a much better infiltration now. Uh, if we look at just over here for a minute at proliferation of the T cells, they, they expand better than the wild type. Not that much better, about twofold, threefold. Um, but that's sufficient, it would seem, to convert, uh, now we're looking at a PR, but a tumor that would normally show partial response to wild type OT1s is now undergoes complete regression in response to the Sybil deficient OT1s. So just by changing one gene, we've been able to 
overcome um, this partial response. And that was published last year. And it works pretty well. So we've got all these different tumor lines we can test it against. And uh, we so tried four different lines. And what we've learned is it, it works pretty well against some tumor lines uh, where it converts, for example, progressive disease to a complete response. But it doesn't work all the time. So we've got one of our progressive tumors, NOP18, is our toughest tumor of all. Um, it's the holy grail will be to cure NOP18. I put that challenge forward. Um, we'll have to send it to you. But, um, so, but this is what the Sybils can do. It's not too bad. They, they can uh, sort of create a state of stable disease, which is, which is not too bad. But, um, so my point is that this looks pretty good, but I don't think it's, uh, if, if the goal is something that works all the time in all of the patients, we're not quite there yet. But we've learned a lot by doing this. So to summarize, uh, I'll just say the, the immune system clearly influences clinical outcomes. The target antigens remain largely unknown, but I think with genomics now, this is within our grasp to answer this question. Um, standard treatments definitely alter T cell and B cell responses, but we don't know whether that's for better or for worse. But we do have uh, techniques that we can apply to this question. And tumors uh, can resist lymphocyte infiltration, as shown in our mouse model and certainly shown in a number of human studies as well. Uh, the stromal and gene patterns are informative in this regard, and you can potentially overcome this by enhancing T cell signaling. <coughs> So when you add all this up together, I think personalized immunotherapy just might work. And I'll just stop there. I won't don't, uh, list everybody here, but these are members of the Dealey Research Center who've participated in, in this work. It's really been a, a team effort. And of course, a number of clinical collaborators for working with um, our ovarian cancer patients, our breast cancer patients, our uh, friends at the Genome Sciences Center, our patients who generously uh, give tissues and blood samples. These ovarian patients are, you know, they've just been diagnosed with a terrible disease and they right away, they give us 200 mil blood samples before they even have their surgery. They give us their primary tumor samples. They come in every three months for blood draws. Uh, they're remarkable. And then funding from a number of different agencies. So I'll stop there, thank you.